from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Paolo Bacigalupi is an award-winning writer of science fiction and fantasy. His debut novel, The Wind-Up Girl, shows a vision of humanity after being nearly wiped out by genetic engineering. It is chock full of weird foods and strange beasts. It's one of the top 10 fiction books of 2009 by Time, won the Hugo, Nebula, and John W. Campbell Awards in 2010. Shipbreaker, his novel published in 2010, was awarded the Michael L. Prince Award for Best Young Adult Novel and was nominated for the National Book Award for Young People's Literature. His recent novel, The Drowned Cities, is a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize of 2012. Paolo Bacigalupi has written fiction for the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Asimov's Science Fiction, and the environmental journal, High County News. In an article last summer on Wired.com, How Cyberpunk Saved Science Fiction, Paolo Bacigalupi wrote that science fiction was stuck in a complacent groove by the 1980s, a lazy boy recliner experience of the future. Competent men of science did competent things. Aerospace was the coolest tech, and politics revolved around the conflicts of nation states. Paolo Bacigalupi looks to inspire and lead a new breed of writers who, took, who looked to touch on raw issues that interest us all. <laughs> In that vein, zombie baseball beatdown bashes you on the head with your very own funny bone, explores raw themes of food safety, racism, and immigration. Now, trying to understand who this gentleman is, he'll certainly tell his own story well enough shortly, but I did a little looking and I, I came across a site that said that it uh, stemmed from a very, uh, it was a very old name, Bacigalupi, that goes back to Italian mythology meaning something along the lines of the kiss of the wolf. Although, couldn't really tell if that was true or not. There was an alternate meaning of it that said some person of dubious integrity. So I'll leave that to all of you to decide. But please, join me in welcoming one of the great emerging writers in this genre, Paolo Bacigalupi. Thank you. I've got a tail with me here, so. Uh, um, wow, hi everybody. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, it's also terrifying to see you. Um, whenever I stand up in front of people and talk, I, I have this almost immediate fight or flee reaction. Um, and so my first urge, just as I was standing down there, was maybe if I can just go hide behind here and throw up for a little while, I'll be fine. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as you know now, my name is Paolo Bacigalupi. Um, I do write science fiction, um, and I do watch people sort of immediately sort of flinch whenever I say that. Um, I've, I've sort of got this, this um, sort of theory about which, which version of literature is most despised. Is it romance? Is it science fiction? Is it children's literature? And whichever one it is, that you're sitting next to somebody and they say, oh, what do you write? You say, I write science fiction. They go, oh, I don't read that. You say. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Um, or you say, oh, well, I write for children. Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's easy writing, right? I wish it was easy writing. Um, but, uh, so, but I actually write science fiction for, for children, for young adults and for adults. And, and I'm really interested in, in, in speaking to different age groups because I feel like I, I have different stories and I have different ideas I want to share with people. Um, and it's also the most satisfying thing for me as a writer because it feels like I get to, get to stretch uh, different literary muscles each time I write for a different age range. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's kind of a little bit about me. Um, I did actually want to ask you guys a question um, because uh, a lot of the inspiration for Zombie Baseball Beatdown, um, <laughs> I still love saying that title. Um, <laughs> Uh, came from came from this sort of very specific realization, and and I just want to ask you all, how many of you have been forced to read a book that you didn't like? How many of you have been forced to finish a book that you didn't like? Right. Okay. How many of you have been forced to finish a video game you didn't like? 
<laughs> we got one. <laughs> um, how many of you have been forced to finish a TV show that you didn't like all the way through to the end? Yeah, a few. Okay. So it's interesting to me that like when you look at media and we look at something like books and then we look at something like video games. Um, it's interesting to me that we've decided to turn books into a medium that is also a misery. Um, and I'm not quite sure why we do that. We have, seem to have some idea that books, even if we're suffering, it must be good for us. It must be worthwhile. It must be important. In fact, in fact maybe even the more we suffer, the more you know, grimy oatmeal we're forced to shove down our throats, the healthier we'll be if we read these good books that are good for us. Um, for me, actually, my experience with this was when my stepmother decided I would not be allowed to read another book until I read John Steinbeck's The Red Pony. And this book, for those of you who haven't read it, um, I'd say don't. <laughs> for me, as, as a kid in middle school reading this book that was good literature, my experience of it wasn't that it was sad or anything like that. It was that it was dead boring. It was, it was a slog. It was a fight to get through every page. The words blurred on the page as I just waited for the page to turn. And I hated that so much. And, and it was interesting because at the same time, I was actually reading quite a lot. But I was reading science fiction. Um, I was reading stories about rocket ships. I was reading fantasy stories about dragons. I was reading about great quests with great swords. And there's you know, something here where I was experiencing joy in reading in another space that my stepmother called trash. And then she wanted to hand me something that she called good. And, and that was where I was supposed to reside with reading. If she had had entire control over my reading experiences, I would not have become a reader. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed in our schooling and in the way we treat books oftentimes is that we know which books are good for us and we know which books are bad for us and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> um, and that's, that's a fascinating sort of value set that we apply to this specific media more than any other media that I've seen. And, and when I go in, so, so all of that said, then uh, my wife is a school teacher. And she teaches uh, children who are generally in the range of uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, that age group. So, um, and she has some kids who hate reading. And so one day she said to a couple of these kids, she says, well, what do you want to read about? Like, let's start with that. And all the kids sort of look at her and say, zombies. And sure enough, if you go out and you look at what's available for a fourth grader or a fifth grader or a sixth grader about zombies, there's a little bit available in books about zombies, but it's all really cute zombies. They're all the, you know, the zombies that just need a hug. <laughs> They're the zombies that you can defeat with hot sauce. Now, at the same time that this is going on, my nine-year-old son is, is play, playing an iPod game called Earn to Die where you level up by getting bigger and bigger vehicles so you can drive over more and more zombies. And you drive over them and the zombies splatter and blood goes everywhere and you know, he's driving faster and he's laughing the whole time while he's playing this little iPod game and driving over zombies. And here we've got, for his age range in books, you have stories about zombies that need a hug, but the iPod's giving him what he really wants, which is he wants to drive over a bunch of zombies. And that moment, I think, you have to look at where your reader is, and if you're going to have somebody become a reader, you're going to connect with their desires, you're gonna connect with the things they love, you're going to reach out and you're gonna meet them where they wanna be. You're not gonna tell them, no, reading is the red pony, here, try this out. You're gonna say, you want zombies? I'll give you some zombies, kid. And that's where I wanted to be with this book. Um, I think that the thing for me that started me as a reader and made me eventually a writer um, was that I found that books were joy. Um, that books were a pleasure, they were excitement, they were, you know, they were getting to watch characters do death-defying things. With Zombie Baseball Beatdown, I wanted to write a story where kids got to fight off the zombie apocalypse, where a bunch of kids with their baseball bats and their teamwork skills were gonna fight the zombie horde and they were gonna save their small town. And, I love that feeling. That, as soon as I started thinking about that story, I started getting chills. I was so excited about writing it. 
So I wanted to meet kids right where they are, which is they want to be entertained, they want to be engaged, and they want to have a joyful experience in books. They don't hate reading, they hate the crummy stories we give them to read. And so I'm going to read just a small section from this, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about also what else I'm thinking about writing and reading and literature. Um, and then after that, assuming that I don't get a, get a buzz here, I'd like to take questions if you guys have any questions. So. So this scene happens, uh, some of the kids, um, when I started thinking about the zombie apocalypse and creating a zombie apocalypse, one of the questions that came up was, well, where does the zombie apocalypse come from? And for me, the perfect location for a zombie apocalypse to start spreading from was the local meat packing plant. Um, you know, meat handling is a very, very interesting thing, where our meat comes from, how our meat gets raised, how our meat gets slaughtered, it's interesting stuff. And uh, there's all sorts of ripe, ripe you know, opportunities for abuse in our meatpacking system. So this was where I decided to start, uh, start my zombie apocalypse from. And in this scene, the kids have snuck into a meatpacking plant to try to find where the source of the infection is coming from. It's here, Miguel said, standing in front of some steel doors. What is? He didn't answer, just swung the doors open. We stood in a cavernous factory room, tangled with conveyors and equipment. Meat hooks dangled from chains overhead, conveyor belts went every which way, and massive boxy machines that might have been grinders or other things, but I couldn't tell, were everywhere. The place was so big, you couldn't even see the far side of it. We eased into the space. It was scary with all the chains and hooks hanging down from their conveyors. What are we looking for, Joe asked. Something that looks zombie, I said, anything. The concrete floors all glistened with water and blood, and everything gleamed. It was chilly, and it had the scent of a meat locker. It was like smelling life gone cold. Our breath steamed in front of us. What about the cows, Joe asked. Where did they go? Miguel waved toward the far side of the huge factory floor. A bunch of them are in the next room over, in a huge pen. The cows get herded up one by one up a ramp that leads into here. Suddenly there was a rattling sound. Hide! We ducked behind the conveyor lines. Footsteps echoed, along with voices calling out to one another. I thought they were all supposed to be gone, I whispered. Another shift? Joe asked. No, it's only supposed to be cleaning crews, Miguel said. The guy I talked to said they were going to be cleaning the whole plant, so the night shift wasn't going to run, just cleaning. Lights buzzed and flickered on. Workers in white, full-body jumpsuits streamed in. Joe found a spot under some of the machinery. Hide here! We just barely squeezed under. Don't let your feet stick out, Miguel whispered. They'll see us for sure. It was tight, but we all fit. From our hiding place, we watched as more and more workers came in. Who do those guys remind you of, I asked. Cleanup squad, Joe said grimly. Yeah, none of these are regular workers, Miguel said. Not with those clothes covering their whole bodies like that. And they don't have aprons like my uncle and aunt used. These have got to be some other kind of mill row people. The conveyor line started up. A door rattled, and suddenly we could, hear, we could hear cows screaming. More workers came in with huge knives and chainsaw-like machines. They fired them up as the line started moving. The first cow appeared. It had a huge hole in its head, but that didn't seem to bother the cow at all. A bunch of hooks snagged it and swept it off the ground as it struggled. The works, workers went after it with knives and saws. The cow tried to bite them, but they were fast. Cutting and chopping, peeling away the skin. The head came off, the belly opened up, the guts went down the drain. The cow's head fell to the floor. Moo, it said. Its hooked body was still jerking around, even without its head. Zombie cow for sure, Joe said, as if we needed him to tell us. The cow was still alive, even though it was completely dead. One of the workers got kicked by the dead cow, but he got right up and chopped the carcass in half. Then water sprayed it, and the next worker whacked off the legs. The carcass whizzed along, carried by the hooks, with more and more workers slicing cuts of meat from the body, even as it kept wriggling. The, wow, look at the rain. <laughs> um, the zombie cow became smaller and smaller, and less and less like a cow, as each worker took a whack at it. Pieces and parts were slashed and sliced away and dropped onto conveyor belts that whisked the meat this way and that way through the processing plant, heading for who knew where. Another cow entered the production line, and the cleanup squad went after that, too. Moo! Slice, hack, chop, woo, 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 went the chainsaws. 
Another cow whacked into little red pieces. More of the line was gearing up. It was crazy loud in the factory now, like we were in the belly of a clanging monster. Ground up meat oozed out of delivery tubes and newly cut steaks whipped down the conveyor lines, shrink, shrink wrapped in plastic. More and more cows were being herded in through the doors and every single one of them was mooing even after it was chopped up and dead. The cow heads that had been discarded lay in a huge pile, snapping at one another and at any workers who walked past them. Pound after pound of red hamburger poured out of the machines around us, blobs of beef that dropped onto styrofoam plates and then went through shrink wrapping machines so that they came out on the other side looking shiny and fresh with Milro meat stickers on the plastic. Labels sped past us. Farmers feast, 100% all natural ground beef. Forest Glen Acres, pure ground beef. High Plains Ranches, USDA natural ground beef. Milro Meats, top quality beef from our family ranches to your family table. Joe had his cell phone out and he was snapping pictures looking sick. I think I'm a vegetarian, he said. Miguel gave him an annoyed glance. Where did you think your meat came from? You think it just bamfed into the night supermarket like Nightcrawler? I had to agree with Joe though. It was brutal and nasty. None of the workers seemed to be worried about what they were doing at all. They were just being super efficient. Even if it hadn't been zombie cowheads lying on the ground, mooing and rolling their eyes and snapping their teeth, the whole setup didn't feel good to watch. I mean, I went out to a farm with my dad once where we bought a sheep for mutton, and we saw the farmer kill the sheep. He stuck his knife in the sheep's throat, and we watched him kill it. And it was uncomfortable, because you could see that something was dying so you could eat it. But killing a sheep up close and personal wasn't like this. The sheep bled and got chopped up, and Dad and I ate it, sure. But this Milrow factory was something else. Cow after cow coming into the plant and getting ripped to pieces, high speed chopping, ripping, tearing, shrink wrapping. I wondered what kind of people could create a factory like this, all for tearing animals apart as fast as possible. It scared me. They're turning all the zombie cows into food for people, I said. I can't believe it. They're insane. It was all zombie cows, not a single real cow in the whole bunch. So this is what ground zero for the zombie apocalypse looks like. Joe snapped more pictures. I sort of thought it would be a military science lab somewhere. We've got to stop this, I said. We can't let them do this. There's a stop button on the line, Joe said. Miguel whacked him upside the head. Not just now, idiot. We've got to report it. We've got to make sure this all gets stopped. We need something they can't sweep under the table, I said. Something the cops can't ignore. Real zombie proof, Joe murmured. Something you just couldn't make up, Miguel said. Moo, moaned the cow heads, lying in a giant pile at the beginning of the meat packing line. Moo. We all looked at each other. A mooing zombie cow head? Yeah, that would probably do the trick. All right, so um, I, I loved writing this book. I had far too much fun doing this book. Um, but one of the things that I also kind of wanted to talk about was the idea that, um, that we know what's good for us in literature and we know what's bad for us in literature. We know what's trashy and we know what's healthy for our kids to read or for us to read. And we separate those things out in really interesting ways. And, and I'm not sure that I believe that that's actually the right way to think about storytelling. Um, I have this feeling that it's possible for us to have our cake and eat it too. That we can have all the joys of running around in the pop culture space of zombies, but we can also talk about other things that are extremely serious. Um, the opportunity to talk about where does our meat come from? How do we treat it? What do we eat? Who's in charge of it? How does it get regulated? Who protects our food? All of those questions are also in this book, and it's one of the things that's a huge pleasure for me is to be able to say, I'm going to tell you a fun story about kids beating back the zombie horde with their baseball bats. Oh, by the way, let's think about how food works in our country, too, because that's interesting. And I think you can have both of those things, and it can all be a fun, thrilling package. And there's none of this, like, oh, it sucks to read it. This is actually going to be fun all the way through. I get to learn. I get to have joy, both, at the same time. And that's where I think that sort of literature needs to be. And that's where unabashedly, we know that almost all other media wants to be is they want to sort of spread joy. Um, they want people to be engaged and entertained. Ga video games, movies, TV shows are all trying to engage and entertain first. Everything else comes second. 
And I think that books have made a mistake somewhere along the line, and definitely our teaching establishment has made a mistake, you know, the way we do our testing, everything, to say, no, good for you first, oh, if you have fun, well, we'll try to accept that, but please, you know, don't, do, don't have too much fun. Um, and I really sort of want to bring those two ideas together. It's like, yeah, we can think about things, we have big thoughts, big themes, and also big, big zombie battles. So, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> so, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, I'm happy to talk about almost anything, so um, feel free and fire away. I guess there are microphones on either side here, so. Hi, um, as an educator of teachers, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. But I, I would also ask the question of how many people have been forced to read a book that they turned out that they loved it. And that could be the book that you're talking about as well as any of the other literature in the world. So I, I think that that's an important question to ask as well. I, I, it's an interesting question is that the question is sort of how many people have been forced to read a book and then found that they did love it later. Um, and I think that that's possible. Certainly I had a teacher in high school who forced me to read Shakespeare for a semester, and eventually I did come to love Shakespeare. Um, I was taught to, taught to eat the, the right kind of food, I suppose. Um, I, I think, though, um, that especially when we talk about our classic literature, that we forget how our classic literature knew that it needed to earn its keep in its time. Shakespeare didn't sit down to say, oh, I'm going to force you to enjoy this. He was actually writing exactly for his popular culture. And, and so I feel like there's a, we've decided that because it's hard, therefore it's good, as opposed to because it's enjoyable, therefore it's good, because it's engaging, therefore it's good. I feel like we've some, somehow managed to sort of worship our past enough that we've forgotten that our present is actually what most writers, the reason why writers are classics now is because they were deeply embedded in their present moment and writing very, very specifically for their present readers. And, and we sort of have managed to separate that within our educational system. I'm not saying that it can't be done. I'm not saying that we can't be taught to enjoy new things. But, um, but especially at younger ages, um, I think that it's a horrible, horrible thing to do to somebody is to say, no, no, keep going, keep going, keep going, it's suffering. It's like, I think you start with the sweets. You, assert, you assume that, for me at least, I think about this as being the question of like, you assume that if I can get book kids to start reading and enjoying reading and loving reading, this is not going to be the last book they read. The idea is it's the first book they read, and that gets them on a journey that goes all kinds of different places. But if I start out with something that's horrible and boring and difficult and not engaging and not relevant to me, then it will be the last book, and that's that. And then they, and the iPods and everything else will take them instead. Um, I do think that there's a point in our lives, and for me, I didn't actually read any you know, major, what we call like quality literature until after I was out of college. Um, until then, I read science fiction entirely. That was what I read, and that was what I truly loved. And then there was a point when suddenly I was like, oh, this is interesting. You know, Hemingway, oh, fascinating. Oh, Virginia Woolf, oh, fascinating. Whatever those things were, I was finally ready for that. If I had stopped reading at an earlier stage, though, I would have never even had a chance to pick up those later books. Um, so that's kind of what I think about. Um, other questions? What exactly made the cow zombies? What exactly makes the cow zombies? Well, I, I don't do spoilers, so like you'd have to read the book, but uh, you can get it at the library too. <laughs> I'm not just trying to sell them. Um, the the things that uh, the things that they start to suspect. I'll tell you this much: that they start to suspect that there might be something in the food that the cows are eating, um, and they start to think also that the way that the cows are being fed and raised in the feedlots at the meatpacking plant, which are very very dirty. The feedlots tend to be very very dirty infected places already. And so when the kids go out and investigate in the feedlots and they see the conditions there and they see some of the drugs that are getting used on the animals to make them grow bigger, they start thinking that there might be something connected to that. So. Can I go? Hi. Um, I'm a mom of three sons and an elementary school librarian, so I want to say thanks for writing what they love. Um, that's, it's a huge challenge to get boys to read. And, we're listening to you with a zzz and this, you know, all the stuff that they love, so that's fantastic. Um, and also for including 
you're making them think. They're enjoying it, but then they're going to think and make some really good evaluations as well. So my m next question is going to be what the kids always ask me. When they find a book that they fall in love with, which they probably will, which one's next, how many are in the series, and how long do I have to wait? <laughs> Um, and and I, I, this is actually uh, this is a difficult one for me to answer because normally um, I don't normally do series. Um, I normally will write a book, and there's a set of ideas that I want to open up inside of that book, and it's oftentimes a, it becomes a standalone. Um, in my young adult work with Shipbreaker and the Drowned Cities, um, I managed to still keep the books in the same world, but I found that I couldn't write a series. Um, I needed to explore different ideas, so. With Shipbreaker, it was really about family and about sort of a boy learning to sort of find his way into a better life. And with the Drowned Cities, it was really all about politics and fighting and wars and, and, and how, we, how we either negotiate or don't negotiate to get along. And so I ended up with different themes, very, very different themes. Um, I do really want to go back into this space, though. And I keep having this vision of these kids. I, I, have, I have more ideas. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. <laughs> So. Why did you use zombie cows instead of regular old zombies? Why did I use zombie cows instead of regular old zombies? Actually, I used both. Um, so there's zombie cows, and then later on when the people eat the zombie cows, then they become real zombies. And so there's a whole bunch of scenes of the kids with their baseball bats having to fight real human zombies also. So both of those things are in there. Hi. Hi. My question was just, you talked a little bit about um, where you got the idea for Zombie Baseball Beatdown. What was your inspiration for Shipbreaker and Drowned Cities? Okay, uh, what was my sh inspiration for Shipbreaker and the Drowned Cities? Um, the, originally, my, my, the biggest inspiration for Shipbreaker um, actually came from the idea that I wanted to write about uh, broken futures. I really am interested in sort of the bad futures that our present day decision making might create. Um, but I also wanted to write about something that was inspiring. Um, and so I was really interested in writing about clipper sips, like high technology, sustainable technologies. And I really wanted to introduce the idea of a new age of wind that would say, we can have a global economy that's based on wind. We used to, in the 1800s we did, all the way up until coal and steamships took over. And so I really wanted to sort of think about new technologies that were inspiring to me, but I wanted to make them seem inspiring to new readers because I kind of wanted to inspire people to go out and build new high technology clipper ships, kind of like the things that are in the America's Cup or things like that, but bigger. And, and yeah, so that was part of it. Um, there's almost always a lot of different inspirations. Um, for the Drowned Cities, actually, my big, uh, my big uh, inspiration was our current political um, problems, our inability to talk across political lines, our inability to talk across differences, and asking the question, really, um, if this goes on, where do we end up? Um, there was a, a line in a very early draft of The Drowned Cities that I ended up throwing away everything else except for this one, one line, and, um, and the, these characters are sailing past The Drowned Cities, and The Drowned Cities are a terrible war-torn area, and this kid asks, he says, well, how do we get this way? How did this place turn out this way? And the captain of the ship says, well, a nation this powerful doesn't just fall apart by accident. Somebody has to tear it apart. And, it says, and he says, the demagogues whipped up the people, and the people bit on their own tails, and they chewed and they chewed until there was nothing left but the snapping of teeth. And that was important to me, the idea that we can actually chew ourselves up um, and I wanted to write about that kind of a world and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we do need to find some ways to talk across our differences. So that was the inspiration for that. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the concept of the infected cows, did you get that idea from mad cow disease? Uh, yes, actually. Did I get the idea from mad cow disease? Yeah, I'm really interested in actually um, mad cow disease. Um, uh, BSE, um, Critzfield, Jacobs disease, yes, um, but also from uh, other kinds of uh, meat uh, food, uh, food safety outbreaks like E. coli. You hear a lot about E. coli in hamburgers. Um, you hear about salmonella sometimes. You hear, also hear about this in other kinds of parts of our industrial food system. Like, you know, uh, I remember peanuts got infected, I think, with salmonella a while back. And it was like, oh, this is interesting. And you find out almost all of your peanut butter is coming from two factories, and that's it. Like, you know, that's all these different brands are all affected by this one peanut factory or whatever. And so that was all of those kinds of food, um, sort of food disasters that we have were really interesting. Yeah. Hi, I just want to say that um, we share the same hated book. Uh, the Red Pony was the first book I ever read that I did not like. 
Uh, so I feel your pain on that. Um, I'm a middle school teacher librarian, and I absolutely loved Shipbreaker and Drowned Cities. Um, I liked speculation with interconnected issues and how it gives the reader a sense of potency and idea that they actually can steer things. But one thing that I think is not really talked about a lot is underlying diversity issues linking all these things together. Those books tend to have, in my opinion, really notable representation of different cultures and backgrounds, people with disabilities, people of color, people of different ages. So I'm assuming that you you know, did that sort of on purpose or at least were cognizant of that. So I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about yeah. why you think diversity is important in young adult literature. Yeah, so the question of diversity and the idea of lots of different kids being able to find themselves in books is really, really important to me. Um, and, and you see this sort of joy that a kid has when they find somebody who's like them in stories and they can connect to that. And you do notice that in a lot of our literature and a lot of our movies, a lot of our TV shows, there's an overwhelming sort of middle American whiteness to it um, that doesn't really represent what we are as America today. It doesn't really represent the globe. And it's a missed opportunity. Um, for myself, you know, and especially, it is, it is actually absolutely deliberate um, that I'm trying to make more and more diverse casts of characters all engaged in doing interesting and amazing things. Um, uh, you know, with Zombie Baseball Beatdown, actually, it was uh, my, the main character is named Rabindranath Chatterjee Jones, and he's half Indian. And, uh, and that's because my son is half Indian. And one of the things that I noticed was that he, when he's able to read a book or see a story or see a TV show, I remember the first time he saw some Disney TV show, he said, Dad, I saw this show, and there's an Indian in it, and he's smart like me. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and you're just heartbroken because you realize how scarce that is for him, that joy and that, that appeal. And so you sort of want to open your arms really wide and bring in lots of different people to experience great stories. So thank you. Thank you. And I think that's everything. So I, I'm, I'm over time now, so they're going to grab a hook with me. So thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.